somewhere in the wall of a gonad in a sea urchin or a starfish, a diploid epithelial cell, ciliated, commences to grow, perhaps over the course of several months, into an oocyte. The oocyte is the cell that will become the egg. It isn't an egg yet. The oocyte is still diploid. It has not completed meiosis, but it has undergone DNA replication. So there's four copies of the genome in there. Uh, and the uh, cell is arrested in the prophase of meiosis, in diplotene. So crossing over has happened. There are uh, condensed chromosomes in here somewhere in this nucleus. Bivalence. There is also uh, swollen nucleolus. That's the part of the nucleus where ribosomes are assembled, among other things. It's the main job of the nucleolus. And of course, stockpiling the oocyte for development means building a lot of ribosomes. This is the boundary of the oocyte nucleus, which is known as the germinal vesicle because I suppose once upon a time, people didn't realize that they were looking at a nucleus. It's so large. Uh, the germinal vesicle in a starfish oocyte is on the order of 80 microns across. For comparison, most of the cells, most of our somatic cells are 10 or 15 microns across. The nucleolus is the size of most of our somatic cells. The oocyte has a centrosome and probably an interphase microtubule array, amongst the functions of which is to anchor the oocyte nucleus at one end. Again, for largely uh, historical reasons, the end where the germinal vesicle is anchored is referred to as the animal pole and the opposite side as the vegetal pole. The oocyte is a germ cell, but it's surrounded typically by a follicle made of, made of somatic cells, that is cells not of the germline. In starfish, they look like this. They're very flat. Maturation consists in the resumption of the cell cycle, the resumption of meiosis, to form an egg. That can be fertilized. That involves shedding the follicle. And in very many animals, it includes the assembly of a highly asymmetric, eccentrically positioned spindle prepared for the most unequal cell division that takes place in the life cycle. Oocyte meiosis produces not four gametes, but just one and some throwaway products. We'll talk about that more in a minute. In a starfish, the oocyte is surrounded by a dense, fairly close-fitting 
layer of jelly. It's a little more extensive than a sea urchin. That's left behind as the follicle cells are shed during maturation. The follicle cells have a role typically in the control of oocyte maturation and also in the, in the nutrition of the oocyte as it grows. Uh, this process over the course of months, if the oocyte grows without help, involves an increase in volume that might be as much as a million fold for uh, some, some eggs, e even more. For a starfish, it's more like 10 to the fourth fold. That's still quite a lot. Uh, starfish, sea urchins, and I'll put it in scare quotes, most animal oocytes, take up yolk and raw materials from the surrounding blood or fluid inside the gonad, whatever the oocyte is bathed in. But all of the gene products inside the oocyte, the stockpiles of messenger RNA, proteins, whatever, come from transcription of the oocyte genome. Okay, again, maturation refers to the resumption of meiosis. The nucleus, the germinal vesicle, breaks down. It may go through one or both meiotic divisions before it becomes fertilizable. The typical thing is for animals to arrest in meiosis one at metaphase, awaiting fertilization. Oocyte maturation represents an acute instance of cell cycle control, which turned out to be very important historically because it's amenable to experimental study. You can get millions of starfish oocytes at once, and biochemists in the 1960s figured out the hormone, a simple small molecule, one methyladenine, you can dump it on eggs, dump it on oocytes, excuse me, and they'll turn into eggs. That meant that people could do biochemistry fractionating large quantities of oocytes to try and figure out what was going on inside them. But first, let me uh, say something about the follicle cells. I'm going to zoom in on one of them. Those of you taking the lab course will have an opportunity to examine them in detail. And the follicle cells are themselves sort of interesting. This space, the jelly layer, is spanned by very slender processes. With the microscopes at your disposal in the lab, you should just barely be able to see these follicle cell processes reaching down to the oocyte cell surface. Bear with me while I complete that drawing. The story goes that follicle cells respond to a signal from the radial nerve or uh, ultimately from the radial nerve in an echinoderm, that is. And in response to that signal from the nerve, they deliver through these follicle cell processes, which are kind of like a synapse onto the oocyte surface, the hormone 1-methyladenine, uh, which within 20 minutes or so, leads to the appearance of something called MPF, or maturation promoting factor, in the oocyte cytoplasm. The hormone that we use to mature starfish oocytes is 1-methyladenine, or 1-MA. So 1MA treatment of an oocyte, even after you stripped it with, of all its follicle cells, will elicit the appearance of this maturation promoting factor in the cytoplasm as demonstrated by the following experiments. It turns out that you can take a maturing oocyte, 
This little circle up here represents a polar body. More about that in a minute. It's the, one of the products of meiosis. You can insert a needle into a maturing oocyte. You see the germinal vesicle is gone. And you can transplant that. So suck some up and transplant that into an immature oocyte. So take the needle and then eject a little bit of cytoplasm from a maturing oocyte into an immature oocyte. And the consequence is this recipient will then mature. You can do this again. You can transplant that cytoplasm to yet another immature oocyte, which will in turn, in turn undergo maturation. And again, in a famous paper, this successive transplantation was conducted four or five times over to demonstrate that whatever maturation promoting factor is, it behaves as if, as if it ignites a latent version of itself in the oocyte cytoplasm. In spermatocytes, meiosis is symmetric. That is, you get four sperm from each spermatocyte. In oocytes, it's the most unequal division of all. And it results in a haploid female pronucleus and two throwaway products, one of which the first one is diploid and the second one is haploid. These are called polar bodies. Oocyte meiosis throws away three of the four copies of the genome into the polar bodies as it undergoes meiosis. In starfish, this will already likely be fertilized by also haploid, by a sperm. And of course, in starfish, as in sea urchins and some other animals. Fertilization is accompanied by the erection of a fertilization envelope that prevents additional sperm from reaching the egg cell surface. This highly unequal division involves a chromosome sorting apparatus that is anchored to the cell surface, the oocyte cell surface, right at the animal pole. This little bud that forms as this division takes place and closes as little cytoplasm as it possibly can to capture this, uh, the set of chromosomes that are going toward the anchored spindle pole. Again, at meiosis one, we have bivalents lined up on the spindle. Those are scissioned from each other at anaphase onset and meiosis one throws away two copies of the genome into the first polar body. During meiosis two, a third copy is thrown away into the second polar body. In some animals, you'll see three polar bodies because the first one goes through an additional division. For future reference, in the next lecture, we're gonna talk about some of the rules for animal cell division, cytokinesis itself. And I'm going to declare that in animals, cytokinesis always cuts 
the spindle always cuts across the spindle. So you might think, does this oocyte maturation division violate some fundamental rule about cytokinesis? Some oocytes, like starfish and clams and, and uh, jellyfish, have centrosomes at the spindle poles, centrioles within those centrosomes. That is probably the primitive condition for animals that the oocyte undergoes meiosis with centrioles at the spindle poles. And it so happens that during the course of meiosis, this starfish oocyte, likewise a sea urchin oocyte or any other kind of, or many other clams, etc., are throwing away their centrioles as well, such that by the time zygote formation is an issue, the sperm is the sole source of centrioles. Some oocytes lack centrioles. So for example, in frogs, they have a bipolar spindle with focused poles. I'll draw in some bivalence here. So they have everything, astral microtubules around a microtubule organizing center of some sort, kinetic or fibers extending back to that pole where the, those fibers are more or less focused, just no centrioles in there. They've, some, they've somehow gotten rid of them beforehand. Um, and insects, so we call this an astral, acentriolar spindle. Many insects like fruit flies it's as if each of these kinetochores on the meiotic bivalent makes its own fibers, it makes its own kinetochore fibers, and then the activity of meiosis-specific motors bundles those together into a bipolar spindle. This is an anastral meiotic spindle. So they too have dispensed with the centriole as the organizing principle. A further extreme in mammals, the kinetic core fibers don't even really focus at the pole. This is also true of nematodes. Somehow these things maintain a sort of a parallel alignment but really they're organized kind of like the staves on a barrel, almost as if these chromosomes organize their own miniature spindles and don't really form a focus pole at all. This is not only an astral, it is an apolar spindle. So in contrast to mitosis, there's a considerable variety of pathways that meiotic spindle assembly takes. Um, many anastral spindles, that is like the spindle of insects and, the, and of mammals and nematodes as well, are organized by kinetochore microtubules growing out from these kinetochores and making bundles instead of from a sing single polar organizer as in these astral spindles. So why do we have centrosomes at the spindle poles in mitosis anyway? What's the point of that? 
And that would be an excellent question to bring to question time, in case you're wondering. What is this MPF that stimulates the oocyte nucleus to break down and the spindle to assemble? Maturation promoting factor turns out to be a protein kinase consisting of two parts, a regulatory subunit and the business end, the kinase that actually phosphorylates proteins, including the histones that st to stimulate chromosome condensation, the nuclear lamina to break down the nuclear membrane, and a whole host of other proteins. Ultimately, the M came to stand for mitosis, even though this is meiosis, we know, because this protein kinase rises and falls in a clock-like way to drive progression first through meiosis and then through the successive cell divisions of the embryonic cell cycle. And it's involved in stimulating mitosis in all animal cells. In a later lecture, we will talk in more detail about the way that a network of proteins, of which this is the centerpiece, makes a clock. But as a prelude, sometimes it helps to think about the design principle involved rather than the actual implementation of the design. And so I'm going to draw an analogy first. So let's say I want to make a clock. I'm going to start with a, a cutoff uh, tube on a pivot here. Here's a pivot on a post of some sort. And up here at the top of this post, I'm also gonna attach uh, a little pipe that, that delivers water in a thin stream to my tube whatever the source is. Maybe I diverted a handy stream or something like that, or, okay, really, in the kits for these things that you buy on Amazon, uh, it'll be a little pump down there somewhere. And uh, so water is gonna come down here in a thin stream, filling this tube over time at some constant rate. And I'm going to put a counterweight in the back of this tube. There's a rock. Convenient counterweight. Of course, over time, this tube is going to fill up. The water level is going to rise to some point where the weight of the water in the tube exceeds the weight of the counterweight, the rock in the back. And so at that point, it's going to spill out Let's arrange a convenient basin for it to spill into. And of course, again, we could make a little recirculating pump back there someplace that feeds this so that it'll go through in an endless cycle. Now, the reason you buy you can buy a kit for this sort of thing on Amazon. This is called a uh, uh, shishi odoshi, if you want one. Say if your garden is plagued with deer, um, then if you put one of these down there with a suitable anvil, Every time this tube tips over and spills out the water and in into the basin, it's going to empty out. Then the rock is all of a sudden going to be heavier than the front of the tube, and it's going to bring the tube back down, and there's going to be a big noise. And that fuck will scare the deer away out of your garden and stop them from munching on your roses or whatever. Okay, now... The cell cycle clock works on a very similar principle, except that 
the water in a pipe has to do with filling up the activity of MPF, which happens to stimulate its own destruction. That's the spilling out part. And then it takes time to resupply the tube to repeat the cycle over again. In a later lecture, we'll see how proteins and their activities are rigged up to make such a clock.